Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to the Berkman uh, Tuesday Lunch Series. I'm Peter Hurdle, a fellow at the Berkman Center, uh, and I am delighted to be able to introduce to you um, Christine Borgman uh, from the uh, Presidential Chair in Information Studies at UCLA. Christine, of course, is just one of the uh, brightest and most important figures in all of information science. I can't, you know, thinking back upon it, how many times I go to her work for insight into what well, we were just talking about, internet domain, uh, naming systems and its history, uh, on search, on uh, uh, information retrieval, and most recently now with data. I was thinking just in terms of uh, citation and how does one cite data, and she's been doing an awful lot of that, but uh, much bigger issues now, especially with her new book, uh, Big Data, Little Data, No Data, uh, Scholarship in the Network World, published by um, MIT Press this January, uh, with a blurb on the back from Jonathan Zittrain, uh, telling us that uh, this is an invaluable guide to harnessing the power of data while remaining sensitive to its misuses. So it's terrific that we can pull Christine away from the Dataverse meeting that's going on at Harvard this week and have her talk to us about uh, data. Now this is a Berkman lunch uh, for your information. Uh, we sometimes go around and introduce ourselves if we're across the street, but not when we're over here uh, because there's just too many people. Uh, the, uh, this is being webcast and is going to be recorded so we will, and is being recorded. So we ask that if uh, at the end, Christine's going to talk for about 25 or 30 minutes um, about uh, data and what it is and, uh, and what to do with it. Uh, and then we'll have open up for questions. We'll have microphones coming around, uh, so you use those for the webcast. You should know that this, the webcast is being, going to be stored, archived, I hate that word, um, and uh, pre let's say preserved at Harvard. Uh, I suppose it becomes data at that point, and what will the university do with it? Well, maybe we'll ask uh, uh, Chris about uh, whether it's data or not. Uh, so if you have any concerns about that, don't um, go from there. Uh, and that's, let me see, is there anything? Oh, and we're using uh, hashtag uh, Berkman, uh, for this luncheon talk. And so those of you who are viewing on the web, if you have questions, please send them in to hashtag Berkman and we'll pick them up and ask them in the question se uh, section. With no further ado, Chris. Thank you. Peter, it's a great pleasure to be here and, uh, and to be back. And uh, it's also a great um, honor for Berkman to have gotten Peter, who has been my go-to guy on copyright and policy around data and scholarly communication for several decades, and we got him to guest speak to my class um, at UCLA by Skype just a couple of weeks ago. So it's a long-running conversation amidst a, a cadre of, of people here. Uh, this is one where Berkman is an ideal place to talk about these issues because we are we at UCLA are in the stages of trying to do a report on data governance on what the policies, the practices, the principles should be. And um, I have my notebook to take notes from all of you as, as well. Uh, but I want first to start by framing a bit from my own research and the book to give you a bit of big picture and then get down to some of the real challenges that are facing uh, UCLA and uh, Harvard and actually all of higher ed. And we had an earlier discussion, I was here in October, a smaller group over at, uh, at Berkman Center. Uh, so this is, as Peter has said, uh, the book, which is a large framing of uh, thinking about what our data in scholarship and um, how we deal with uh, sharing them, reusing them, citing them, giving people credit for them. And the middle part of the book 
is a set of case studies walking through the diversity of data and applications in the sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. And I close with questions of archiving, stewardship, curation, and uh, what, to keep, what to keep and why, because no one's claiming that everything should be kept. But we are certainly at a stage right now where we are drowning in data, and in many respects it does look like salt water. Uh, we're swimming in it. We don't know quite what to do with it. We don't know what the risks are. We don't know how we can get the, the power out of all those data that we would like to have. So this is the, the short overview. I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes just about what are data in the first place, and uh, then the policy issues about the data we collect, principally for our own research, but also about students, about faculty, and uh, then the data we collect about ourselves, uh, much of which is falling through the cracks, and it's a chance for those of us who think about data and think about scholarly communication uh, to put our energies into real action policy for the universities before things get any messier. Okay. So what are data? Um, big data is the buzzword. I thought I was over it, other people were over it, but you still have to kind of explain what people might think big data are. Uh, this three-partite definition comes back from about 2001, the Gartner Group, and it said data can be big in at least three respects. They can be big in terms of the volume, uh, in terms of the variety, how heterogeneous they are. You certainly see that across uh, different scholarly areas, um, or the velocity, the rate at which they're coming at you. Then we added uh, the big in terms of uh, value, big in terms of veracity, and we ran out of Vs and went out to a lot of other ones. Uh, but you can see that even at that level, people don't agree on what it means to be big, that many dimensions that might be big. The long tail metaphor also is popular. This is even more reductionist. Suggest you can take all data down to just two dimensions. And in scholarship, that would mean we've got a small number of researchers, like the astronomers and the high energy physicists, who have a lot of whatever it is. And then many people who have less of, of whatever we think that is. Okay. Uh, we've also got definitions around open data. And the most basic one is this idea that data are open if they're free, if you don't have to pay money for them, and it doesn't have a lot of license restrictions. That's some of the things that Peter and I talk about, the nature of licensing and whether they're even subject to copyright, what might be licensable, and, um, and what not. Uh, but here the difficulty is being open, being free, doesn't necessarily get you toward anything particularly useful. Making the haystack bigger does not make the needle easier to find. Okay. So there's some open data. Okay. And a whole lot of open data is about that useful. Okay. If you don't have metadata, you don't have provenance, you don't have software, you don't have code books, you don't have something that is really very useful to anyone at all. Now, this definition from the OECD, which has been around since 2007, is a far higher bar. Uh, but as you can see, it's a huge number of parameters. The odds on making data open so you satisfy all of those is, uh, well, nigh unto impossible. You, if you're going to make the data have legal conformity to whatever jurisdiction you're in, it may not have legal conformity to some other jurisdiction with which you are collaborating, for example. Do you want to be interoperable with your immediate staff, immediate community, interoperable with people in another discipline that you're working with? We run into this all the time. Okay. Quality, sustainability, and so on. So it's pretty messy, and this is where I ended up. And usually when I'm talking just you know, from the book or the larger research we're doing, I'll spend a lot of time on examples, but today, today I won't. But rather to say that to think about what data are, you really have to take a much more epistemological approach. It's not stuff, it's not bright, shiny objects. It is, data are in the eye of the beholder. So this is where I said they're representations. It's when you use them as evidence and certainly many of you are lawyers or, or lawyers-to-be, understand the notion of evidence. And uh, 
I mean, think about just eyewitness testimony and how fuzzy that is in terms of the differences of, of who saw what and when, so, when something becomes data. Okay. So we've got all of this contestation around it and many groups coming up to deal with it. We've now got the Research Data Alliance, uh, which was founded in late 2012, already has uh, members from, I think, 60 countries around the world. The uh, meetings, which are twice a year, are getting up to um, five or 600 people. And this is the first time that you've had a big forum where people dealing with astronomy data, with survey data, with humanities data, all come together to one forum. So we're starting to get more of a conversation. But the precondition to research data sharing without borders is that researchers actually will share their data. And that turns out to be the hardest one of all. And again, that's what our research is about, is we spent the last 10 or 15 years following uh, people around, primarily in the sciences. We spent a lot of time here at Harvard and astronomy and CFA. And um, we've been following the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, um, working in some bioscience areas, physical science areas, embedded network sensing and so on, and looking at why it's so hard. The incentives aren't really there, uh, the amount of effort it takes to make those data useful to somebody else to get value out of them that you weren't able to get value yourself is not really there. The ownership is often a huge barrier. People have no idea what the legal status of data are, so it simply doesn't, never leaves the lab, never leaves the office, uh, rather than try to uh, confront all of those. So the dealing with the governance issues kind of starts with this fuzziness of people not agreeing on what are data in the first place. So these are some of the kinds of data that we're concerned about governing that we would collect by our community. Obviously, the research data, but there's also all kinds of university analytics that we're collecting um, for teaching and learning. So we're collect they, they cross that border of being, sometimes they're collected about our community, they're certainly ones collected by our community. The policy and management responses here, we've got the mandates of funders and journals, and I'll get to that slide next. Um, research data management services, I've got a slide on that. Harvard is way ahead of the game on dealing with some of those issues. Uh, release and retention practices, those are things that librarians and archivists think about. Uh, there's you know, certainly some in other legal areas of how long do you have to keep something? Do you keep it a year? Do you keep it five years? What's the evidentiary status of it? Uh, people who never wanted to think about those things are starting to have to think about those things in doing their own research. Uh, and then the laws and policies. Certainly things that fall under human subjects are fairly clear. Some things fall under open records laws. Uh, faculty in particular are realizing um, the hard way that your email may be available under open records laws. Your research data may be available under open records laws. You often get clashes between these. The university lawyers are now getting very busy explaining to people how they should separate their personal email, their university email, and so on. And then we've got the HIPAA in the medical, FERPA in educational records, PII, personally identifiable information, which is a particular legal category. And I think that may be state by state. I think the California PII is probably different than the Massachusetts PII, than the federal PII. But a lot of what we're concerned about is things that just fall between the cracks. They're risky data. They're not governed. People don't think about what they might be up against of um, working with them. Okay. The open access policies cover the publications and the data from your research. How many people in this room have uh, filed a data management plan with a funding agency? John, OK. Centuries. Centuries ago. It's only been a requirement for a few years, but being a data guy, you were ahead of the game on this. Um, 
Okay, so this may not be quite the world at all. You'll be walking into this. If you haven't taken uh, your intellectual property courses, do. They will serve you no matter what area of law you went into. Uh, my husband got his law degree in Texas. Everyone had to uh, take oil and gas law uh, to pass the Texas bar. Um, he wishes he had taken intellectual property law instead. It would have done him much more good um, along the way. Uh, so this is just kind of a, a balance of some of the things, and it's really changing in the U.S. right now. Uh, the office, out of the federal executive branch, the Office of Technology Policy, John Holdren's office, issued a directive in February of 2013 that required all U.S. federal agencies that fund $100 million or more of research and development to make available their publications, their research reports, and their data. But it didn't say how they were supposed to do it. So each agency, Department of Energy, National Institute of Health, Institute for Museum and Library Services, so on and so forth, is coming up with their own plan of how to do it. So you are going to have different requirements depending on who you get your funding from and whether it's acceptable to put it in to Dataverse here at Harvard, whether to put your publications into DASH here at Harvard, uh, whether you can put them into SSRN, the Social Science Research Network, uh, what the different publishers will allow, what the embargo periods are. All of this will be coming down on those of you who publish and those of you who are release, who are doing data funded under any kind of public granting, but also under, if you're working for, say, one of the DOE labs, you're going to be under these as well. The Australians are the only ones I've found that have put these into their code of conduct. So the code that you sign to do research, get a grant, your good data management is part of that, uh, but it's sort of implicit in many other ways. But the point is funding agencies around the world, including the Chinese, are going in this direction and starting to enforce it. Dataverse that I'm speaking at tomorrow, it's having its first really big community meeting. It's out of, um, started in IQSS, the Institute for Quantitative uh, Social Sciences here. And you can now put your own Dataverse on your personal website. You can do university level. And uh, this is Harvard's response that is now being picked up in many other places. And it gives you a workspace where you can put your data as you're doing your research. You can keep it to yourself. You can share it with your collaborators. You can let it, you can open it in stages, roll it out, release it to the journal as you wish, you know, as the requirements go. And they're really working directly with journals and partnering in some very interesting ways. So watch this space if, if you're interested in that, that set of issues or come on to the uh, meeting list tomorrow. Now here's where it gets messier and messier and there's fewer and fewer people working on it yet, but I'm hoping the people in this room will help us sort some of these things out, um, is the data that we collect about our community. And this top part has uh, the Asilomar Conference. Again, I have a slide in a moment on that. How many, there were, some of the people at Berkman were involved in that Asilomar Conference. Any of them here today? Okay. No. Okay. So we'll, we'll go on to that. Is how many of you are enrolled students at Harvard? Only a few. How many are summer interns? Okay, others. Do you have an ID card, a magnetic card that you tap and use for an ID? Okay. Do you know how much data that is collecting? Okay. All kinds of data. That is every place you've been. That's your debit card. That's your library card. That's your internet services card. It may be your health care card. It's your dorm card. And you combine that with the course management systems, the university knows every time you went to the website. They know if you did your readings, if you downloaded them. They know if you submitted all your your assignments on time. If you are somebody who always uh, puts them in late, we can see that model. We can see if you're in trouble. And some universities are making decisions using those kinds of data. And one of them is even doing red light, green light, um, yellow light of, do we steer this student out of this major? Do we steer this student to health services? Do we steer this student to mental health services? Okay. What do we do with this student based on these data analytics that we are getting from these systems? 
Um, I had a, this conversation with my niece who just finished her freshman year at University of Illinois, and she's going into IT specialization in business. And I said, Elizabeth, how, you know, what are you learning in your business IT classes about how to manage this? Just think about what's being collected. And her eyes got wider and wider. It didn't even occur to her the trace that she was leaving as she moved around the Urbana-Champaign campus. And so you know, students are starting to think about this. Faculty are starting to think about this. And they're starting to partner with outside agencies. Now, that's one of the things that brought it up. Uh, so we're, we're working primarily from the two use cases of the student records and the faculty records. UCLA finally is automating the personnel uh, academic promotion system. Now, uh, UCLA has been a leader in technology in other areas, but there have been so many fights over who gets to collect what and what they're going to do with it, that it's been a heavily paper-based system and crates of paper go across the campus every time people go up for promotion and review and merit. And to make a database out of this is sort of a, you know, an unstoppable momentum, although a lot of people are just trying to throw as many bricks in front of it as they possible. But you know, if you keep throwing bricks, you're not going to accomplish much, because this, you know, this is a train that's left the station. We need to think about how we're going to govern it and who's going to have some say about it. But we're definitely getting you know, the publications, your grants, your teaching evaluations. This came up already is teaching evaluations are supposed to be to improve teaching, not to judge you for promotion and tenure. Should those data go from the Office of Instructional Development into the academic personnel system directly? Some people think yes, some people think no. Okay. Uh, but again, the university has a lovely rich set of information uh, on faculty as well as on the students around the campus. So this is the Asilomar that I mentioned that we talked about when I was here in October, is you know, starting to think about this big array of data and, and how it should be managed, what are the values, what are the criteria, and drawing upon the, the Belmont principles, the, the um, the common rule, the kinds of things we deal with for human subjects. There's certainly principles there uh, to guide this. But as universities say, what are we going to do with all this stuff? And companies are seeing this as a business model showing up and saying, oh, we'll run it for you. And then you don't know what happens when those data leave the campus. Um, we're, we're trying to deal with that. And Epic, and I'm in the, you know, full disclosure, I'm the board of directors of, um, of Epic. And this is one of Epic's big pushes is student privacy rights and has come up with a student privacy bill of rights. Okay, so there's, again, there's people working on this front. Uh, the bibliometrics is the part that's really fun and it's an area that I've been working on for a long time and I just finished, a, actually the papers were due last night, we're on quarters, uh, for the PhD seminar on scholarly communication and bibliometrics and really teaching it as a research methods course uh, to doctoral students in information studies and to think about the quality of data and what you can collect. So this is a snap from the book bibliography, which is also up as an open Zotero file. That's a clip from a law review. Very different kinds of formats. How many different uh, bibliographic formats do you think are out there and widely used? How many do you think? Sure. Chewing. Um, uh, about 10 to the 1? 10 to the first, so about 1,000 or so? No. Uh, about 10. 10, 20, 30. Okay. Less than 100, but more than 10. Got it. Okay. Got it. Um, it's higher than that. <laughs> <laughs> Who uses Zotero? Zotero. Zotero. Okay, Zotero. Look at the Zotero style sheets. 7,500. Every journal, every publisher. EndNote, just as many. Mendeley, just as many. You are never going to get clean data out of this. Even if people were good and meticulous about their bibliographies at the end of papers, you are not going to get clean data because the algorithms cannot deal with 7,500 different formats in which those page numbers might have occurred if the, even there are page numbers and if people got all the middle initials right, which they never do. Okay. So here's just a quick snapshot from my personnel review last summer. Um, my resume lists about 200 publications. 
a web of science, found 145 of them, Scopus uh, found 77 of them, and Google found 380 of them. Okay, all right. And that's because Google is picking up all the versions, and they're picking up the slides and the YouTube videos. They will pick this up as a publication. Um, if the metadata is properly done, which being a good cataloger, I know you will do, Peter, um, is on here. But you know, look at the difference in the H index. Look at the num different number in the citations. You know, and this is about a year ago. Okay. This is what happens. And this morning, we were over at the Center for Astrophysics and looking at what the astrophysics data system does. Fabulous statistics, but only within that w within the ADS. And again, so it, these are closed universes of what they pick up, but we are using them to map scholarship. We are making beautiful pictures of how information flows around the world, across disciplines, across countries. We are making policy funding decisions across these. And then when you've got open access policies, and the University of California one is very similar to the Harvard one, is we're buying commercial services to go scrape data from publishers, websites, and others around the world to feed it in to uh, respond to those federal policies about what we're supposed to be keeping and the embargo rules. Okay. So these are being used, and once people have data, they like to use it in ways that you don't always know. Uh, this is one we were talking about this morning. Now we have Altmetrics, which is a company on top of a, a phrase being used. And the head of it I was talking to last week readily admits um, that alt metrics are neither alt nor metrics. Okay. Um, you know, they're alternatives to citations, and these are really indicators as opposed to metrics or, or true measures. So this is one, Alyssa Goodman in astronomy, Alberto Pepe, who was my doctoral grad. Uh, I was on it. This was a Radcliffe seminar a couple of years ago. 22,000 views. So very popular, but three citations as of this morning. Okay, uh, Google Scholar found 13 citations to 24 versions of this document, which we also grabbed this morning. Okay, so these are just not going to be good data, and yet they are being used. And very large companies are coming to universities. They are taking these data. They are selling them back to you and using them so deans and directors and department chairs can make decisions about people. So that's how we ended up, and you know, for my sins of complaining that this was a real problem and we need to think about it, is good, you, know, you fix it. Okay. So this is uh, Kent Wada, who is UCLA's chief uh, privacy officer and chief information security officer, and he and I have been making trouble together for quite a while now also. And this is just the rough set of questions that we're trying to deal with, is how should UCLA collect and organize and use the research analytics, who should have access to them, uh, both within the university and in partnership with others. We were asked to deal with the governance principles and the governance processes. You know, what are we going to do on the ground? And this task force was jointly charged, and this is very important, jointly charged by the executive vice chancellor and provost and the chair of the academic senate. So the faculty and administration are working together to say, how should we govern this, and let's, let's think about it. And we have members from the faculty, and we have members from people running operational systems that are on this board, and we've been working on this since fall, and we're already a couple months overdue on report, because every time we get close to report, it gets harder, okay? And that's why you're gonna help us figure this out. Uh, this set of principles came out of, actually, first it came out of the UCLA Privacy and Data Protection Board, again, a joint board, and then they went up to this UC-wide privacy and information security. And this is now part of UC-wide information policy. Uh, and we've actually gotten a privacy and data protection board and chief privacy officer on all 10 campuses just in the last year. That was a major, major breakthrough to have done that. Uh, but this is um, an important distinction that we made, and we hadn't seen other people make it before, between autonomy privacy and information privacy. The starting point for this board, which was charged by then uh, President Mark Udoff, and then he approved the report, Janet Napolitano has now approved the report and put it into practice, um, asked us to look at privacy and information security. But the starting point was your usual kind of driver's license credit card information, where we quickly became concerned about this much broader array of data that are being concerned. 
and said we want to be concerned about the ability of individuals to conduct activities without observation and inform protect information about individuals. And the security spans all of these. Okay. So that this is a principle we found very useful. We're sticking to. That's pretty straightforward, that code of fair information practice and so on. We are building for the governance. This is, so the goals, we want to resolve legitimate disagreements, because it's pretty obvious, even you get eight people in a room on this, t on this task force, and the people building the personnel management system want one thing, and the pe people from the Institutional Review Board want something else. So we're kind of playing it all out across this room, and we've got the, camp, the ch Campus Chief Le Legal Counsel on it also. So we want to resolve these. We want to promote transparency and open discussion. We also want to reduce the risks of breach, uh, breaches and such and leverage our structures. So it's, and we want to look at data held by the campus that goes beyond just things covered by FERPA, HIPAA, PII laws, and so on. And we've got these competing things. What we're really finding is people will come to the IRB and say, is it okay to do this? And, they, and the IRB says, are you going to publish it? And they say, no, it's just for evaluation. And the famous Harvard study of turning on the cameras in the classrooms, which I assume everybody here knows about. Oh yeah, okay. Um, that's one of the cases we've looked at. And people were not informed in advance. You did not have consent. People didn't know about what was you know, being done. And apparently they went to the IRB, and the IRB says it's not an IRB problem. And if, it do, and if the IRB says it's not us, there's no place else to go at most campuses, including, including ours. There's no place else to go. So part of it is where do you go if it's not IRB, but you've got sensitive, potentially sensitive data okay, that falls through. So these are some of the triggers. So this is what Kent and I have just been hacking together in the last week or two, is when, do we, when does this process start to take hold? So it's definitely about decision making. So it's data about people. Uh, if we're collecting data without people's knowledge or consent, people have no idea how much data actually is being collected about them. Uh, when they're used in ways that, so if you gave consent for one kind of use and you want to reuse it for something else, we think we should trigger these policies. And that by me, new data, and, and particularly if you want to take data from multiple places, which is the usual big data problem of combined for analytics. And we're also seeing that if the data are going to stay completely within UCLA, we've got pretty good governance structures of things like the Information Technology Planning Board, the Privacy Board. But when we want to partner with these various companies that want to come in and sell us services, and we want to keep our values on it and not let them have data that they could use for unintended purposes later, that's also where it gets really, really sticky. And it also hits the fan when you hit other universities. So when UCLA and Harvard partner on something, you know, should, we, you know, should we kick these policies in at that stage? Okay, so this is roughly the model. It's got a couple charts here. So there's the EVC and provost, the board that was set up. And this is who's on it right now. The voting members are a mix of faculty, administrative. We've got students on it. And then we have uh, particular people. And we've got audit and advisory services on it, too. Okay. And then we've got this dotted line to the IT Planning Board and Academic Senate and this Oversight Committee. So this is where some of the decision making comes in. And the privacy officer deals with the training and awareness and some data use questions and implementing these policies across the uh, UC system. And so trying to, so we end up with the chief privacy officer as the triage point, but Kent has a, a few too many jobs already. I mean, he can't really triage all of this stuff, but to sort of, is it IRB, is it not IRB, where should it go? Um, and so this is the set of discussion questions that I ended up with figuring if anybody could help us figure these things out, it would be this group. So I'm hoping we can talk about, uh, you know, the, is this the right problem to be addressing? Is, you know, the uses of data that are not covered by the obvious sets of policies that universities have in place. 
Um, and how should we scope it? Every time we think we've got some flow, then the question is, what's inside the box and what's not outside the box? Because you don't want to shut down the entire university, say nobody can touch data until they come talk to Kent Wada. That's not going to work either. So do we scope it by who's the, who the data are about, by what they're going to use it, by the agency collecting the data, by the partners? What are the criteria? And what are really workable governance processes? Okay. So if you can help us think through some of those, um, I will take all those back to UCLA and we'll write up the final report and give it back to you. Okay. All right. Let me stop there and I'm going to take notes. Okay. Thank you. So surely that's provoked some discussion. Okay. Uh, yeah, I heard about four different books in uh, <laughs> that talk uh, and the range of things, not to mention the questions you have at the end. And I could start things off, but let's see who has. Um, I'll throw it open to the floor first. I'm curious if you've seen evidence of students or other people kind of altering their behavior once they know about these data collections, like uh, for universities that look and see like the extent to which like using students' browsing habits and looking at their academic performance. I wonder if you've seen evidence of students maybe downloading papers that they won't read just so the system will show that they downloaded it, stuff like that. No doubt, no doubt. It's very hard to track those things, of course. We certainly know in the citation behavior that people will have uh, you know, certain obligatory sites that they will make to other people, and they will cite their lab mates and their others to kind of pump up their, their H indexes. Uh, but you know, as any time you take things down to one indicator or one index, you're just asking for it to be gamed. And, and, and people will game these numbers, and they'll choose whichever one looks best. There's a wonderful paper out of um, Mexico a couple of years ago where this group created a bunch of fake papers and just put them up for Google Scholar to index. Because Google Scholar is, is you know, it, that's actually, actually a very small project. And they're not, and they're, you know, they say it's just algorithms where the, the publishers ones, you know, do more data, you know, do much more editorial and data cleaning. And sure enough, they just, you know, the paper says, you know, day one, day seven, uh, you could see the index pick up. Uh, then, the, you know, they started citing these papers and they watched their H index just climb across these fake papers. So basically they proved how easy it is to game it electronically. Now they couldn't get those papers into a legitimate journal indexed by Web of Science, but they could get them into Google Scholar, which is, is simply you know, a network mechanism. Okay. So yes, people definitely, uh, this has long been known, and if you're interested in the bibliometrics, there's a group at Leiden in the Netherlands, uh, CWTS in, in, in Dutch, Paul Wouters, W-O-U-T-E-R-S is the head of that. And uh, there's a Leiden manifesto that was in Nature recently, and there, because Europe has gone even more mad than the U.S. over citation indicators, and they're dealing with the ethics and, and responses to those. Thank you. Um, my name is um, Tim van Elst. I'm a medical student from Leiden, the ah, Netherlands. Okay, perfect. perfect. Um, my question is: uh, To what extent can people can students say no against data collection and still attend a university? Uh, so, can students say no until and still attend a university? Probably nigh unto impossible. At least under the the current current mechanisms. Uh, the, the best watchword I heard lately was, let's make our systems information radiant. Okay. Is that a great phrase? Um, so you know, people are building systems to throw off data. Um, I tried doing without a UCLA Bruin card for a few years. I was like the last holdout, you know, just objections over these. And, you know, after a while, you, you know, you can't register for classes, you can't use the library, you can't use the health services, 
if you don't, you know, if you don't have one of these. Now, you know, certainly the data directive and the data policy in Europe is different than the U.S. policy. You may have, on the one hand, you may have more protections of students in Europe. I don't know, uh, but certainly as faculty, you do not, because uh, under these national plans for the kind of metrics to compare countries and things like the EU funding, they have agreed on something called C CRIS, uh, Research Information Systems, the Coordinated Research Information System. Look at EuroCRIS, CRIS, and you will see they've come up with standards and metrics to compare universities all across Europe, and faculty have to submit like every new publication, every new artwork, and so on, as part of their terms of employment. So the metrics are even more intense in, in Europe in some respects than the US. But the student ones, I don't know what the degree of protection is. Opting out is, as, as far as we can tell, is nigh unto impossible. Hi, um, I'm Saul Tannenbaum. I'm a local blogger. I come at this as a sort of former practitioner, having spent a whole lot of my career doing scientific computing support for researchers mm -hmm. and then moving um, into university infrastructure and dealing with these sorts of data, um, mm -hmm. having walked away a number of years ago um, for a whole bunch of reasons related to this. Um, and my introduction to the hard part of this field was a, a four to five minute conference call amongst top tier universities trying to understand what the university's obligation was about retaining data about dead faculty. Mm -hmm. um, right. And it was a deep and complex mm -hmm. discussion um, and you know that was sort of my introduction to the cuckoo house um, that this is. And having watched this, I mean, I go immediately to your last discussion question. What are workable governance processes? Um, and sort of generalize that to what are workable university governance policies? Um, and you know, my, my observation was that you know, a university's ability to grapple with these questions was you know, partly based on how sophisticated you know, the faculty and staff were at even you know, understanding this. And I mean, the, it's one question I have in, in UCLA, you know, how good is your you know, board? Do they actually understand these issues? And the other part was whether there are actually workable university governance processes mm -hmm. about you know, things in general, whether it's you know, faculty promotion, mm -hmm. um, who owns the room scheduling, mm -hmm. um, you right. know, right. athletic fields, I mean, physical objects, yeah. mm -hmm. et cetera. And if there were fights over those things, right. you know, then you're, yeah. you know, well, it would seem hopeless for the less tangible objects. Okay, well, let me, let me deal with that in a, in a couple of ways. Um, one is that most of these are policy problems masquerading as technology problems. And some of them, like the, the dead faculty problem, uh, shows up as an IT problem when it lands on the desk of some poor low-level person and the dean or the widow or widower wants access to dead spouse's email account and wants the university log on to have the full access to the journals and all the other services that went with deceased person's account. And then poor IT person brings this if they're, you know, you know after a while and sort of in tears at some point, to the, this was one of the first things the Privacy and Data Protection Board dealt with is to realize that it was definitely a masquerade at that and this poor person was the wrong place to be making those decisions because you had tuition, you had registrar issues, you had all kinds of other things up here. So this is where, um, you know, speaking from you know, having spent 30 years in University of California, um, I think we have a more functioning system than most places. It's slow, it's not a fast moving system, and the deans have far less power in the, than at Harvard, and the faculty have far more power than at Harvard. It's a very deliberative process, uh, but it means that uh, we can get these kinds of partnerships going where we can get the faculty and the 
uh, people with the money in their pockets in the same room to hear each other. But even at that, UCLA is the only one of the 10 campuses that has the joint IT planning board, which has been in place for 15 years, and the privacy and data protection board, which has been in place for 10 years. And this is our 10th anniversary, and we've been doing a number of things around that. Uh, and in that 10 years has meant that we've built up a lot of institutional memory. And we've been trying to share that institutional memory around the 10 campuses, which is also why we pushed for trying to get similar structures. And so when these things come up, they don't continually, and that's part of why we want something that is a process, because otherwise it's tabula rasa every single time. And when you say, ah, we've seen the dead faculty problem before, we've seen the email problem before, we've seen the graduate student who didn't finish the PhD can't pay the fees, and the dean that says, just, let's just waive them um, and give them full privileges, which is a complete violation of the other accounts that we have with the library, and so on and so forth, is, you know, we've seen this enough times that we know what's an IT problem, what's a privacy, what's an IRB problem, what's a data governance problem, where we can begin to shuttle it and move it in different ways. But it's, I haven't seen other people, we don't have all the answers, this is why we're looking for them. Okay. There's at least three more out here, okay. Hi, thanks for your talk. My name is Jessa, I'm a postdoc at Microsoft Research. And ah. uh, as far as your penultimate, I have a comment and then a question. The penultimate um, question about uh, appropriate criteria or values, like to me, it's legibility is the most important thing, right? Like so, and this is just stealing from Daniel Solo Solove. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but like what's truly disturbing about you know the NSA collection of data or agency collections of data is that we don't know when it's being collected or what to what end or how it's being stored. But if those processes become legible, then you know that's a more that's a that's a, a pro you can at least contest the process, you know? So um, that, that's his thing about the Kafka-esque metaphors of privacy. So when I see governance questions, um, it's more compelling to me if I can, if I can say, you know, there's the, the reason we're gathering it or right. these things exactly. are legible. So um, yeah. that's the value that I'm most interested in. But then as someone who's gone both from industry and I'm going into an academic gig next and I've, you know, whatever, moving between those things, I'm struck by the ways that, so my question is about do academic institutions have a higher um, burden, like an ethical burden? Like, are they obligated to be more ethical in a way that we don't necessarily expect of industry researchers or government researchers? Like, how, what, what is your sense of whether the, we're putting a higher ethical requirement on that, and, and should it be that way? And just for a second, I'll digress and say that, I mean, it's so nice to go through the equivalent of an IRB process at Microsoft Research, right? Like it's just the most sane thing you've ever experienced, right? You sit down with a lawyer and then they sort of walk you through it and it's like, oh, this is great. This is so much better than the crazy arcane systems that I've used at many different institutions partnering with collaborators. And it's like, oh, if it were just this way, like an earnest conversation with a lawyer about potential re legal problems rather than like, how can I game the IRB system so they won't ask too many questions about my research process so that I can get my work done? Um, and so that bringing that back to what ethical obligations do we put on academic institutions that we don't put on other institutions and is that a good or bad thing? Right, excellent. Um, well, okay, so first off, I was really telegraphic about the sets of principles. And you know, definitely, we're building on the uh, not only the you know your basic common rule, beneficence, justice, and so on, uh, but the code of fair information practices, which goes back to 1960s, and that has to do with the transparency of data collection. Um, you should not have secret data collection systems. People should know. People should have the ability to inspect and respond and you should be able to have consent, informed consent, and so on. So that's you know, very definitely a layer that's, that's built in here. As far as the higher uh, status, um, I mean, I've worked with Microsoft Research about the last 10 years, too, and, and they are you know, certainly been much easier to deal with. Although the first time I dealt with MSR, the, we had this 10-page thing, we needed 10 lawyers in a room. And then later they said, you know, let's just make it open source and a one-page agreement, and then they became so much easier to deal with. Okay, but there's it's a later stage at that. Um, we think, 
and maybe we're even more you know, concerned about the values as a public university, uh, that the university needs to be a protected space where you know, if students can't go into a classroom and assume that they are not going to be filmed by security cameras and they have some equivalent of Chatham House rules, that they, you know, that they should have the, the ability to say in a protected space to, you know, to exercise new ideas and not feel like they're going to be quoted or tweeted at, at everything they say, um, which is not the set of assumptions that you have in, in most for-profit business requirement, you know, business situations. Uh, you know, certainly we want them to get smart about this so that they don't assume that what, you know, the protected space, the university, goes with them in a little bubble wherever they go. But if we can at least, you know, the nature of education and learning should be that experimental, not, not being creeped out about being tracked about everything, which is why we're so concerned. And because these systems are built, it's, it's virtually impossible to opt out, back to Tim's question before, but the other side of it, and one of the reasons that we've got all these university analytics people on this data governance board, is we have to report all kinds of statistics to the state of California and to the U.S. federal government. And Harvard has to, re has to you know, provide all kinds of analytics around time to degree and diversity and you know, this, that, and the other thing. So there's some amount of analytics you simply are legally required to get. So students cannot opt out of them, faculty cannot opt out of them. And given that you can't opt, opt out and you have to submit them, how are you going to govern these responsibly? So that, that's the conversation. There was a question waiting over here, I think. Here and then, uh, and then here, I think. Thank you so much for the talk. The first part of your talk was about uh, interoperability and the legibility of data sets for different researchers in different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And you listed a bunch of government regulations around that or, or organizations cross borders, data mm -hmm. cross borders. I was wondering whether the scientific community in, at your university is concerned about replication of experiments. And if so, are, you know, what are the initiatives that you think are the best initiatives mm -hmm. that are underway now to permit access to data to replicate experiments? Or what would you suggest to solve that problem if it's not yet being done? Uh, well, UCLA is in a particularly delicate situation at the moment if you're following the uh, Michael LaCour case. Ah, well, uh, uh, L-A-C-O-U-R, you will find it very quickly. Um, <laughs> the paper, uh, UCLA graduate student, the paper was retracted from science, yes, okay. Yes, so we are, we are having very exciting times on campus. I made a great end of term discussion in my data curation and policy class, I can tell you. Um, yes, we are, we are duly concerned about these things. Um, I have uh, perhaps a different take on the replication and reproducibility problem, which is that the notion of replication and reproducibility and verifiability and um, inspectability and legibility and transparency, everyone in this room has a different idea of what that means. And scientifically, I mean, it's, it's the epistemological problem of just what it means to reproduce something. Do you go back out in the field? Do you go back to the data set? The replication data set that LaCour did file was the cleaned data. And that satisfied the legal requirements or the requirements of science, which is as rigorous as anyone. Um, there's a very famous uh, set of studies in uh, social studies of science by Harry Collins about gravitational waves. And the one group uh, only believed the experiments that confirmed them, and the other group only believed the experiments that failed to find them. Okay. So, you know, you, again, you get into deep arguments about what reproducibility means and what you trust and methodological issues. So, you know, the replicability, you know, there's certain ways you can get some threshold. We want openness, we want transparency, but if you get too demanding about it, you're going to slow the progress of science, and it's back to the gaming problem. You know, people will file a spreadsheet with unlabeled rows and columns. We find them all over the place because that's how they do their work, and that will satisfy the letter of the law. Okay. And the LaCour case came out because somebody said, oh, this is just too exciting a finding. Let's see if we can do it too. 
and then started looking closely at the data and following the footnotes. So it wasn't clear that anything in the standard way the science is done could have found it if somebody is clever enough and fast talking enough to fool that many people for that long. It was pretty amazing. Um, and you know, we, we, you know, we don't want to hang him until you know, he's had his fair trial. Um, there are a lot of checks and balances that, you know, that, went, that went on through. Uh, but it came, once it came out in the public and enough people were able to have access to it. So this is another concern here, is you don't want to be so risk averse that you lock everything down. And that's also where we started on the UC-wide compliance or UC-wide privacy information security is the compliance people, the ones coming down the medical side said, oh, this is a compliance issue. We'll take care of it for you. And the faculty said, no, you won't because you will lock down every bit of data. We will not even be able to share a spreadsheet with a student without filling out 47 forms if we let it be a compliance issue. We need to do our research. We need a free flow of dialogue, but we need checks and balances and governance. So this is why it's, you know, what are the triggers? When do you do this? And how risk averse do you want to be? And it's, it's, yeah, it's three books in here, but I'm hoping you'll help us figure it out. Okay. Here. Hi. Um, I uh, ran a social listening program at a major bank here in Boston, and I am now an incoming faculty member at Syracuse University at the Newhouse School. I'll be teaching social media there. So oh, okay. I am painfully aware of uh, how effectively you can monitor external social media. So um, in regards to the scope and data governance, you know, I would, I would kind of divvy it up from like what's within your university firewall system and then what's external and publicly available information. And then, you know, just think about how we are able to actually track students and faculty's external social media use and what we can do with that and when we can use it and, and have some processes in place. And just also curious to see if you've had any experience with that, um, kind of external social, Twitter, Facebook, uh, we got aware of this in the very early MySpace days. <laughs> yeah. and it was, one of our doctoral students was the original MySpace people, so we got the sort of inside, inside view of what was going on. And the, it was a, we treated it as, as a teachable moment at the um, initiation of the dorms for incoming freshmen of be careful what you say because it will be with you forever. And getting them, uh, you know, and getting them to be more sensitized to the whole process. Uh, the University of California has had a um, a we do not monitor policy in place for twenty some years, and was revisiting it that, that led to this. And um, you know, so we are very careful. And being in Los Angeles, um, guess who's a very convenient target for the recording industry and the movie industry. We have had these really knock down, drag out, over my dead body kinds of conversations with, I mean, they, they will come to campus and say, oh, it's so much work to monitor for copyright violations. Let us just attach to your system and we will monitor for you. <laughs> and that UC wide electronic communication <coughs> policy has protected us and we've said, sorry, we can't do that. And then they said, well, why don't you go to the UC Office of President and change the policy for us? And, and you know there was so much pressure that was part of why that you know we had to revisit these things in, in an age of, of information radiant systems and go back to it. Uh, you know we, we follow the law. If you know if Hollywood finds a violation, we have to trace to the IP address and we have to send a nasty letter. But we absolutely do not attach to our systems. I mean traffic shaping is the most that we do. Uh, but there are, there are other universities, you know, some of which we know the names of, that will use these course management systems and say when people are in trouble academically, and then they will look at their Facebook fa feeds and say, is the student uh, making enough friends? And then do a red, yellow, or green on them, which we find appalling. But other universities, which I won't name on a, 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 a webcast, um, are um, apparently doing some of this. Yeah. 
So you've got, I mean, it's back to, you know, how high a standard do you want the, the university to have? Okay. Other questions? Just a quick question yeah, sure. on your uh, privacy and information security policy. Mm -hmm. Is it, are all the uh, policy provisions the same for students, faculty, and staff, or do those different populations have different protections? Well, this is, um, this UC-wide policy is more of a principal's document. It doesn't, it doesn't get down to very low-level policy, and the campuses have a fair amount of autonomy of how they implement, you know, of the 10 campuses around California. Uh, so some of them are divided. So I mean, this is also why I'm asking this question here, is how we should divide these up. Because, you know, things like FERPA, the family evaluation, if you don't know FERPA, it's, it's the student records laws. Um, those are clearly by the subjects of them. The academic personnel is clearly by subjects. But there's a lot of other things like that Bruin card and whatever the Harvard equivalent that cuts across. And we even said, can we distinguish between students, faculty, and staff? Well, a vast majority, well, vast majority, a large, a substantial portion of the students are also employees. So you can't get a clean line there either. So it's, we're having a very hard time um, getting people by status. Now, we've tried to say in our community is not deal with, say, med patients at the medical center. And figure most of that's covered by HIPAA anyway. Okay. So we're trying to do, we're, we're particularly concerned with kinds of data that are not covered under the obvious well-known policies because it, it's these things f slipping through the cracks where people go to IRB and say it's not an IRB issue, it's not a HIPAA issue, it's not quite PII, but it is definitely sensitive as far as thinking about it in terms of what, you know, what are the risks, do we have consent, what could it be used for, what are the values, um, you know, sharing things like student analytics with um, outside companies. And, or even with other universities is, you know, how, how do we want to handle that? Because more, there's more and more, you know, efforts and partnerships that are coming up. So, um, not easy if you can help us. And here's, uh, and there's the links. Again, we're trying to work in the open. There's the link to the data governance and the, uh, this is here. And there's also a short paper on the privacy information security that Kent and Jim and I wrote in a new book that Epic just published on the future of privacy. So, Chris, um, a couple places in your slides you talked about data collected by UCLA, but universities are outsourcing all their IT um, to commercial yeah. outfits. Um, I know at Cornell, student emails being handled uh, through Gmail. Yeah. Uh, many of the videos for MOOCs and are being done through YouTube. Um, so isn't, is, is university collected data really becoming sort of moot and, and it's how we deal, you know, the question is how to interact with the commercial world and, and set the, the terms that we want to have? That's certainly a big piece of it. Um, and the, it's, you know, the, the outsourcing and, and what should we do ourselves, what can we reasonably do ourselves and not, and what are the trade-offs in, in doing that. But yeah, I mean, that cat's out of the bag in terms of, yeah, yes, there's all this kind of outsourcing. Certainly, the con what kind of contract you write with Google around Gmail, and we fought the Gmail train for a long time and then, um, and, and then lost it because the servers, the, the Bruin online servers were dying and they said, do we rebuild them or do we take this very attractive deal? And the previous administration had said, once you let go of that infrastructure, you will never be able to get the internal interoperability back again because you know, then, then you've hived off that piece of the infrastructure and building these other pieces is gonna only get, gonna get harder. But then a later generation came along and the deal was just too good to pass up. So there we are. Uh, of, of dealing with those. So it's, uh, yeah, it's how do you govern that? And, but it's also, I mean, the other side of the, the legibility is just plain getting people to care. 
mean, the faculty are so upset about this academic personnel system that they really care right now, so we can get them. You know, this is a point they care, and we can get them sensitized. But a whole lot of these things, it's until somebody's data gets breached or somebody realizes what kind of dossier ex exists on them that it, that it comes up. So we want to sensitize people. We want them to be more active, and we'd like them to um, deal with it before they end up on the front pages of not only the Harvard Crimson, but the New York Times, and, a few, and become a case study for other universities of, of how not to handle these things. Okay. Well-intentioned processes, but you know, there you there you go. So, any last question? Well, thank you so much for a stimulating uh, afternoon. Uh, what you've heard today is exactly what you would find if you got to big data, little data, <laughs> no data. Uh, big issues. Uh, a tremendous breadth of knowledge, all presented in a way that's very accessible, very readable, uh, terrific case studies, and uh, plenty to take away with you uh, when you're done. So um, please join me in thanking uh, Chris for um, her presentation today. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks to all of you. I have several pages of notes to take home. Okay, good.